Good morning, Duluth. Welcome. Uh, this morning, I just ask that you um, prepare for the Word this morning and um, just empty your burdens and let's be present. Let's engage by joining in praise and singing and invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And I ask, please stand as you're able and join us. This is a new song by We the Worship, We the Kingdom, I mean. Jacob, Israel, whom I have called, 
I am He. I am the first and I am the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they all stand up together. Matthew 13, listen to these words. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your living home. Your presence, Lord. shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and
Good morning. Ha go ahead and have a seat. It's so good to see y'all this morning. Um, braving the elements this rainy morning. We're glad you're with us and glad you're joining us if you're watching us online um, this morning. I want to take just a moment and invite you. Um, remember, we are still following the uh, guidelines for COVID. Um, keep your mask on and social distance. But I invite you real quick just to turn and greet those around you. Smile real big with your eyes. Um, wave to everybody. Tell everybody how good, good it is to see everybody. And we're so glad you're with us this morning. And I am so happy to be back. I want to thank everybody for... Um, for all they, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for your, your prayers and your thoughts, the cards, the emails, the texts. Thank you um, after through this knee replacement surgery and the rehab. Um, it's good to be back. But I want to, uh, in particular, thank those that um, Don Clayman and Jeff Green and Julie Hall and Josh Stam and Tiffany Goodman and, and um, Ken Willie and Alan Servideo and Wes Wood that, that made sure everything went on. Um, they were here all these weeks and just kept going and going. And, and um, uh, what a great team. And, and you add into that the first, week I, first weekend I was gone, um, Pastor CK was supposed to come in and preach those two weeks, those first two weeks. Well, then she found out she had been exposed possibly to COVID, so she had to go into quarantine for two weeks um, and the band kind of got thrown this monkey wrench at the last minute on that first Sunday, and they covered everything. I couldn't ask uh, you guys what an amazing job, what a team that's in here, and thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. And then last week, uh, Laity Sunday, thank Michael Deans and Joanna Burchett for giving our messages last week. What a great job they did. Um, and they both came back um, this week, so... Uh, Thank them for the, the wonderful messages you guys gave last week. That I love Laity Sunday to hear from our lay members um, to come up and fill all those roles. It's such a special, special Sunday. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so again, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, any prayer concerns this morning we need to, to raise up um, for all those that are still suffering from the virus? Anything else or, that we need to raise up this morning? Nick and Lisa Barnett. Rick and Lisa Barnett. Okay, Jeff? Doris Matthews. Doris Matthews. Ann. Reichert. Okay. Yeah, Ann Reichert. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. Anything else this morning? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, this morning, we just pray that your spirit would overflow this place and every, overflow every heart that's here this morning for all those that may watch us online. We just want you to know that you're welcome here. And that we would ask that your hand be over all that happens here this morning, every word that is spoken, every word that is sung, um, everything that happens, we would ask that your hand rest on it and remind us that it is for your glory, not for us. And we just come humbly this morning to praise and to worship you for all that you have done and you continue to do and that you promise you will, that you will do. So Lord, for all those prayer concerns that were raised we just ask that your healing hand be on all of those and all of the other concerns and worries that we all carry and bring in with us. And may you heal as only you can heal. Lord, for the praises, the celebrations, the joys that we raise, we thank you for only through you are these possible. Lord, for everything that's happening in our world right now, we just ask that we all be aware that your hand is still on everything. And that you are still the one true God in control. But this world is broken. And we would ask that um, we see your glory, we see your presence and feel you. 
And may we work as directed by you and given strength by you, encouraged by you to expand the kingdom here on earth and the here and the now. So Lord, now today, speak to us the word that each one of us needs to hear. And may we hear it. And may it be more than just words in our ears. May it affect us and transform us more into the likeness of your son, Jesus. We ask this in his precious and holy name. Amen. So this morning, um, we, we are beginning this season of the church that we call stewardship. Um, and it's, a, it's about a four-week long, and not about, it is a four-week long process um, of these Sundays that we call this season of stewardship. And, and um, yes, we're going to be talking about money over these four weeks. Um, and I know some people are uncomfortable with that, but I would remind you that Jesus talked about money more in the New Testament in his earthly ministry than he did anything else. And I think if it's that important to Jesus, then it should be important to us. And it's in my prayer is that over these next four weeks, we come to understand that this is more than just about money. Stewardship is, is more than just about money and our, and our giving. It is, about, it is about growing in our relationship with Jesus. And you're going to hear us use the term in this service and in the sanctuary services and throughout these four weeks, you're going to hear us use the term grow one step a lot. And I want you to understand, and I hope it settles and resonates in your heart, that this, it's not just grow one step in your giving, it's grow in your relationship with Christ and everything that you do in your life. And if you do that, if your relationship with Christ continues to grow and is giving as part of that, will continue to grow also. And it doesn't come out of a sense of, of have to or duty. It becomes, it, it, giving becomes out of a sense of love and appreciation and thankfulness and faithfulness and the model of Jesus in our lives. So I want, and what better passage text to begin stewardship season than the one we're going to look at this morning? And I want you to hear this from the Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 13, um, the parable of the dishonest manager. And I'm going to be reading out of a, a, a new translation that I found um, called the Passion Translation. Here it is. Jesus also said to the disciples, a certain rich man heard that his household manager was wasting his estate. He called the manager in and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me a report of your administration because you can no longer serve as my manager. The household manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is firing me as his manager? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I am removed from my management position, people will welcome me into their houses. One by one, the manager sent for each person who owed his master money. And he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 900 gallons of olive oil. The manager said to him, take your contract, sit down quickly and write 450 gallons. Then the manager said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. The manager said, take your contract and write 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted cleverly. People who belong to this world are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful with little is also faithful with much. And the one who is dishonest with little is also dishonest with much. If you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you haven't been faithful with someone else's property, who will give you your own? No household servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as, as I said, we're in this season of stewardship and we kick it off with this parable from Jesus who this parable quite possibly could be one of, if not the most confusing and misunderstood parables or teachings that Jesus gives in the New Testament. And it goes so much beyond just money. How is our discipleship and our following of Jesus and our relationship with him, how does it grow? Um, and how in that growth in our relationship with him, how does that influence the, what kind of stewards we are of all the gifts and blessings that God gives with us, to us? How do we manage our time? How do we manage our relationships? How do we manage that balance of work and family? And yes, how do we manage our possessions and our money? So my prayer through all of this as we go through the next four weeks is that we all grow in our relationship with Jesus. And as a result of that growth, that there will be, we begin to realize that none of these gifts that we have that God shares with us are ours. God shares these gifts with us for a very specific purpose. And I know some of you will say, well, I earned it with my job. Yeah, but I would encounter that and ask, how did you earn it? With gifts and talents and abilities that God has given you in the first place. And these things are given to us by God and he shares these gifts with us for a specific purpose. And we are to simply be the best stewards possible of these gifts that God shares with us. And over the next four weeks, we're gonna take a look at the specific purpose of how we are to steward and use these gifts God has shared with us. And this passage from Luke, for some of us is misunderstood, it's confusing. And one of the reasons for this misunderstanding and confusion is because on the surface, it seems that Jesus is commending someone who is being dishonest. That's what it seems like. With a quick on-the-surface reading, it seems like Jesus is saying, hey, nice job for being dishonest and a cheat. And this morning, I'd just like to take a few minutes and explore what this parable, what, what it might really mean and how it can apply to us. So let's jump in. Verses 1 and 2, Jesus said, Jesus also said, said to his disciples, a certain rich man heard that his household manager was wasting his estate. He called the manager in and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me a report of your administration because you can no longer serve as my manager. So here's what's going on. There's this rich man who entrusts or, or gives management of his wealth and his possessions to a manager or a steward. And this manager is being dishonest with all of his boss's stuff. So the boss calls the manager into his, into his office and he says, yo, bro, what's up? What's this I hear about you wasting and squandering all of my possessions and all of my assets? You've got some explaining to do. So finalize your books, give me your final report because effective immediately, right now, you're fired. So, so far, pretty clear, right? Not much confusion. That's what's going on. We're pretty clear on what's happening. So let's go on, verse three and four. The household manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is firing me as his manager? I'm not strong enough to dig and too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I am removed from my management position, people will welcome me into their houses. Translation, man, I'm getting fired. And I am not about, under any circumstances, to go out there and do manual labor. Not gonna do it. And you gotta be crazy if you think that I'm gonna go out and beg for money. So what am I gonna do? I need to come up with a plan so that when I'm out there on the street, somebody is gonna be thinking about me. Still not real hard to understand. Fairly clear what's going on. Makes sense so far. 
verses five through seven. One by one, the manager sent for each person who owed his master money. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 900 gallons of olive oil. The manager said to him, take your contract, sit down quickly and write 450 gallons. Then the manager said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. He said, take your contract and write 800. So what's happening here? What's going on? Basically, this guy has come up with this ingenious plan, and he's like, instead of me being out on the street or begging or having to do manual labor, real work to make some money, what, is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the amount of money that is owed to my master. And they'll, they'll think they're getting a discount. Then that way, whenever I get out there, when I'm fired and I'm out on the street, when I get out there, all of these people will owe me a huge favor. They're all going to owe me and I'll be taken care of because what they owe me, they'll take care of me. Still makes sense. Okay. Everybody's still following me. He came up with this ingenious, but very sensible plan. But right here is where the story takes a turn. And, and something really strange happens. And this is where it starts to get confusing. Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he acted cleverly. Now, just reading that, we think the master or Jesus or God says, nice job. Dishonest, lying, Cheating your master, nice job. But is that really what happened? Or is there something else going on? How can the master praise the steward for cheating him out of his money? The question is, is that really what's going on here? Or could there be something else that is happening behind the scenes that makes it make a little bit more sense? Closer look. What we have to be careful of is taking our 21st century culture and how things work now and imposing that on this first century parable and first century culture and thinking that that culture operates exactly the same way we do now. And that's very, very false. First century Jewish culture, totally different than what we live in now in 2020 in the United States. In our culture, if I'm a business manager, I hire somebody to take care of my product or assets or wealth, and I pay them a certain salary or hourly wage for what they produce for me, and that's how they make a living. And I pay them for the value of what they produce for me, right? That's how we do things. But that is so different than in the first century. What would often happen according to tradition and sources we have was that you would hire someone to manage your assets and collect debts for you and manage your wealth and whatever they charged above and beyond what, their, what your debtors owed you, they would slip in their pocket. So whatever they charged that was more than the debt, then the steward put in his pocket. That's how they made their wage. You didn't pay them a salary. Whatever they could charge above the debt amount was what they were allowed to put in their pocket. Example, here's how it worked. If Elizabeth Deans owes me $50 and Caitlin Alt works for me and goes to collect the $50 from, from Elizabeth, Caitlin would sit down and write amount owed $50 commission $30, total bill $80. Elizabeth, you now owe Caitlin $80. And Caitlin would collect the $80, give me the 50 that it owed to me, and slide the other 30 bucks in her pocket. And that's how Caitlin made her living. It wasn't cheating the master. Essentially, what he did was cut off the top the amount that he would have kept for himself eliminating his own profit so that he was only collecting what his manager was really owed. And in doing this, everybody wins, right? The customer is happy because they feel like they've got a big discount. 
The master is happy because he's got paid what he's owed and the manager is happy because he's made a bunch of new friends who are now going to owe him some huge favors after he gets fired and he's out on the street. And the master said, dude, you're still fired. You're still not going to work from me because you're dishonest in a lot of other ways too. But this is genius. What a great plan. I like how you're thinking. You're still fired. But I like this. Now, here's four things I, I want us to think about with this parable and what we can take with us. Number one, we need to be honest, right? We need to be honest. Listen, dishonesty and a lack of integrity are eventually going to catch up with you. Eventually. You might be able to get away with it for a little while, but over time, in God's kingdom, in God's economy, it's going to come back and bite you. Eventually. It may not happen in this lifetime, but as this parable shows, we're all going to have to give an account of how faithful we were. At some point, we're going to have to stand in front of the throne and give an account on all we were given and how we managed it and then what we did with it. Key principle here. I want you to remember this. No amount of earthly riches no amount of earthly riches are worth being dishonest for when our heavenly riches are worth so much more. Number two, we need to be wise. Verse eight, people who belong to this world are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. Understand, people who belong to the light are uh, people who belong to this world are the unbelievers. And those who belong to the light represent believers. What he is saying is that those who are unbelievers will do anything they have to do to ensure that their futures and their needs are taken care of. They will plan. They will strategize. They will do certain things in the business world to get ahead. It doesn't matter who they step on, who they cheat, who they stab in the back. They will do anything and everything they need to do to make sure their futures and their needs are taken care of and that they can get ahead. And that's exactly what this guy does in the, in the parable. He does what he has to do to ensure that he's taken care of and his future is going to be okay. And for that reason, the master commends him. But sadly... We as believers, as followers of Christ, are not sometimes willing to put forth the same creative and the same creative and energy and wisdom to advance God's kingdom here on earth. And in addition, we're less concerned about securing our heavenly future and doing what we need to do this side of heaven. And this is so sad because our heavenly future and riches are worth so much more than our earthly riches. And number three, we need to be generous. Verse nine, I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that we should always be using our wealth, our possessions to try to advance the kingdom of God here on earth and the here and the now. In other words, we should be using our wealth to pour into people's lives to expand and advance the kingdom of God here on earth. We need to use our wealth and our possessions to further the kingdom instead of trying to build our own personal earthly empire. And if we do that, we will be welcomed into our eternal homes with celebration and with joy. And then number four, we are to be faithful. Verse 10, whoever is faithful with little is also faithful with much. And the one who is dishonest with little is also dishonest with much. Listen, it's easy for us to say, well, if I just had more, well, if I just had a little bit more, I would be more generous. If I just had more money or more stuff or more possessions, then I would give more. I would give more to the church. I would help out more. But Jesus says, be careful about that thinking and that attitude. Because if you're not faithful with the little that you have now, 
You can rest assured, and I'm telling you right now, you're not going to be any more faithful or generous with what you have when you have more than you have now. It's not going to happen. So it's important if we want to have more of whatever we're looking for, it's important for us to be faithful with what we already have so that we can be trusted with more later. Because how much more is enough? How much more is enough? What I have found over the years is that more money or more stuff or more things that you have, it just never seems to be enough. If you have this, you want this. If you make it here, that's still not enough. Now you want here. And it just continues to grow. More is never enough. And verse 13, no household servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Listen, we are given our gifts and blessings by God for the purpose of being good stewards of those gifts to build and expand the the kingdom of God here on earth, not, not to build our own personal earthly empire. And Jesus is saying that you can't do both at the same time. We cannot hoard our wealth and possessions to build our own earthly empire and secure our own earthly comfort over using our wealth to build the kingdom, to bring glory to God. We cannot be a slave to wealth and still serve God. At some point, that wealth becomes your God. And the true God becomes secondary or an afterthought. But here's the thing. When you continue to grow in your relationship with God, when you continue to take another step towards God, when you continue to take another step in following Jesus, you are promised and you are assured eternal riches. And these riches are worth so much more than any wealth you can build here on earth. Gracious and loving God this morning, we thank you for the gifts, the blessings that you bestow on all of us. And we just ask this morning that you would give us the strength, the courage, the wisdom to be good stewards of these gifts. And use these gifts for the furtherment of your kingdom. And may we be faithful in what we have instead of living a life of wish, wish, wish for more. Lord, we ask all this this morning in the name of your precious and your holy son. Amen. As I said, we're beginning stewardship and we have somebody to give us a message this morning on stewardship. Clark Brame is going to come and speak a few words for us this morning. Clark? Thanks, David. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Um, You probably know me from behind the camera there and also occasionally doing scripture readings. Never been asked to do this before. And to be honest, this is probably something I wouldn't have agreed to do had some strange series of events not taken place this week. You see, I wasn't even supposed to be here Today, I was supposed to be up in Virginia helping a good friend of mine work on his house. He's doing a project. He's way behind. He reached out to me and said, hey, you know, could you come up here and give me a hand? And this is somebody that's helped me out a lot over the years, so I was willing to make the trip and go help him out. And Thursday afternoon, he calls me and says, hey, my wife is sick. I'm not going to do any work this weekend. I'm calling it off. You know, we'll do this another time. And it wasn't about 10 minutes after that that Brian Johnson reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to do this. So while this is something I'm not entirely comfortable with, I kind of took the hint uh, from the universe or the Lord and said, you know, that's too much of a coincidence. I think I ought to do this. So here I am. So uh, good, good way to start this off there. But uh, 
what Brian asked me to do was basically get up here and in two minutes, so I'm guessing we have the same technology they have at the debate and they're going to cut this off at two minutes. He was very specific about the two minute thing. He said, just get up for, for about two minutes and, and say why you give to the church. I said, okay. So I thought about it and uh, like everybody that has joined the church and you've seen people stand up here when you join the church and you, you're asked those series of questions, you know, will you be loyal to the church? Will you... Uh, give of your service and your presence and your gifts. And you say, yes, I will, and you're in the club at that point. And I did that too. And so the simple answer to the question, why do you give? Well, because I'm supposed to. I said I would, so I'm going to do it. But I, that's kind of a, a little too simple. It's a little more than that, obviously. And I sat down in my thinking chair in the living room and, and with a pad of paper, and I started writing down reasons why this church means a lot to me, why I actually do write that check every month. And it's a lot more than just because I said I would. And as I started listing all the reasons why this means so much to me, the one thing that kept coming up in every one of them was gratitude. Uh, I'm, I'm very thankful uh, for this church uh, and what it's done for me. I'm also thankful to God uh, for what he's done in my life, uh, the blessings he's given me. And, and to Jesus, obviously, for what he did for me on the cross. Uh, so when I write that check every month, uh, it's not about obligation. It's not out of a sense of duty. It's out of gratitude and, and joy that I do that. And as you know, right now we're in some, some very challenging times, and we really need the church more than ever, and the church needs us. So, you know, we're all going to come together in this way uh, to defeat this, but we also need to come together to support our church. So my recommendation to you and my message is do that with a sense of joy and a sense of, of gratitude and not a sense of, of obligation. Um, that's my message. So thank you. I think I got that in in under two. Good? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Clark. Um, and as we enter this time, as we prepare our hearts and our minds for a time of giving, um, I just want to let you know what's out there on your chairs. You've seen um, in four weeks, will Consecration Sunday will occur, and you have this 2021 estimate of giving card that's, um, that we'll be asking for by that date. You can fill it out today and put it in the baskets if you show desire or fill it out and bring it to the church. But they will be here each Sunday from now until uh, Consecration Sunday for you to have and to fill out and to be praying about as you make uh, your commitment. Also, there is a chart here called Grow One Step, and we'll be going over that in a little more detail in a couple of weeks. But it just kind of shows um, what, what a tithing would be for certain salary levels. Um, and you can do the math on those if you're in between, um, and then our giving units within the church on the back side, and we'll explain uh, more about that in a couple weeks. Um, but we just wanted you to have that information as we enter this season. Um, and now as we prepare our hearts for our time of giving this morning, I want to remind you that if you want to drop your offerings, there's a basket uh, back on that table in the back and by this door over here. The best way is online, DuluthUMC.org. Um, and you can find the online giving information there and get signed up to do that for recurrent giving, then you don't have to worry about it every week, and it just makes life simpler, and that's a great way to give. So now, if you would prepare your hearts and minds for this time of giving as an act of worship and praise to God. Gracious God, as we come before you now so humbly with our gifts, we just thank you for all that you have blessed us with. And we come with glad and joyful hearts, not hearts that come with a have to or a burden, but out of hearts of gratitude and joy, we come and give our gifts in praise and worship of you. So now bless each gift and bless each of the givers. And may you multiply these gifts beyond anything we could imagine for the furtherment of your kingdom here on earth in the here and the now. In the name of your precious and holy son, Será do mar. 
ones who do not bear me All the broken pieces of their heart Blessed are the tears of all the sky falling stars blessed all the wounded ones mourn brave enough to show their long scars blessed are the hurts that are not hidden open to the healing touch of God go unnoticed, serving with unguarded gratitude. Blessed are the ones who fight for justice, longing for the coming day of peace. Blessed is the soul that thirsts for righteousness. Welcoming the last, the lost, the least The kingdom is yours
God's people said. Amen. Again, it was great seeing everybody this morning. Thank you for being with us. Um, thank you, Julie and Don and Jeff, for being here uh, and leading us in worship this morning. A lot going on in the life of the church, and a couple of things we want to highlight for you before we, before we leave this morning is next Saturday, uh, the 31st, is Halloween. Um, that afternoon, that evening from 5 to 6.30, back here in the back of the church, um, we're going to be having a... Uh, um, I don't know what, quite what to call it, Halloween celebration uh, back there. It's not going to be our traditional trunk or treat with, the, with COVID and everything. It's just not doable. Um, but we will have some things in the back parking lot. We encourage you to bring uh, some donations for the Hands of Christ Duluth Co-op. Um, there'll be some picture taking, bring, wear your costumes, um, all that kind of stuff will be in the back parking lot, 5 to 6.30 next Saturday. And then that night... Don't forget to change your clock and turn your clock back an hour. A lot going on next weekend, Halloween, full moon, and change your clock. So all on the same day and night. So be aware of that. We don't want to miss you um, next Sunday morning um, with that. And then I invite you next Sunday, if you'd be with us, it's, it is All Saints Day next Sunday, um, where we will celebrate um, and remember those who have uh, made their journey to their eternal home with Christ. We will celebrate them next Sunday on All Saints Sunday. So we invite you to be with us next Sunday for that. Grab a Sunday supplement if you don't have one. They're on the table in the back. If they're not in your chairs, everything that's going on is in there. Now, if you would join me, if you would stand as you are able, join me for the benediction and the sending forth. Gracious God, as we leave this place, may we go as people who trust in you, who are thankful to you for the gifts and the blessings that you have bestowed on all of us. And may we go, depending on your courage and wisdom, to be good stewards of all of those gifts and those blessings, to be generous, to give to those in need, to expand your kingdom and share the love of your son Jesus with this entire world that so desperately needs us. May we be your people in this world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.